It's not easy being a third tier epic hero. So many hours spent working out in the gymnasium, honing your battle skills. Presumably one moves on from sparring with one's peers in the boxing and wrestling rings to hunting down and fighting off local bandits and marauders. Then on to one's first military campaigns, vying to join the ranks of those who pick out the toughest champions in the opposing army to duel with. Maybe if you've got the guts and your local traditions allow, you might turn to monster hunting if you're into that kind of thing. But it's just as important to develop your profile. Epic heroes need their Kleos. I'm not talking here about the tiny minority who get to feature in their own epic. That's the preserve of the A-listers. But to even make it as a minor hero, you're going to need to get at least one major poet to give an Aristyre to you in someone else's epic at the very least. And with so many heroes to choose from, you've got to work hard to get some poet's attention for that. I mean, for sure, the epics of Homer and those guys have casts of dozens of named and briefly featured minor heroes. But what about the other thousands of men in their accompanying contingents? Those that feature as nothing more than as a number in a catalogue. Nor must we forget the importance of currying the favour of a god or goddess. I mean, all epic heroes need their guardian deity, right? That takes a lot of effort, unless you just happen to be the son of one or just super hot. So it's a lot of hard work. But hey, suppose you make it. Maybe the work's paid off. Maybe your glory and heroic deeds will be sung and resound through the ages. Unless you're Tidious then no matter what else you do, the only thing you get remembered for is just that one time when you got a little overexcited, got a bit carried away, and... Tidius stands up straight and meets Melanippos face to face, crazed with raging ecstasy. He looks upon his gasping mouth, stares into those fierce eyes, and recognises himself. He utters a command, Decapitate and bring me his head! Then, holding his foe's head in his left hand, he gazes upon it and is aroused by the sight of the indignant, incredulous eyes as they cease to flicker. The wretch would have been content with that, but the vengeful fury, Tisipani, pushes him to further transgressions. Already, Athena has arrived. She has persuaded her father and brings glorious immortality for the poor man. But look, she sees him covered in the gore of brain pulp, polluting his mouth with fresh blood while his companions try and fail to wrest the head from him. The gorgon upon her breast bristles. Her snaky tresses escape their bonds and stand up straight to shield the goddess's eyes. Athena turns away and flees from Tidius as he lies, nor does she return to the heavens until her eyes have been purified by the mystic torch and the copious waters of pure Elysos. This is the first in a series looking at some of the less well-known classical epic heroes. We won't be exploring the stories of Aeneas, Achilles, Odysseus, Gilgamesh, or any of those guys. We'll be looking at the B-listers, and if you're lucky, the Z-list too. In this episode, we're taking a look at everyone's favourite craniophage, Tidius, son of Oinus. Aside from head munching, Tidius is most famous as the father of his far more illustrious son, Diomedes, who is often called by his patronym, the son of Tidius. And it is through addresses to, or speeches by, Diomedes that Tidius is referred to in our earliest source, Homer's Iliad. The first major extant source describing Tidius directly and at length, albeit through the reports of a messenger, is in Aeschylus's Seven Against Thebes. Tidius was, indeed, one of the titular seven, and it was at Thebes that he met his death and ate brains. And it is in the longest surviving ancient version of the Seven Against Thebes story, the Tabayad by Statius, where we can find the longest, most drawn-out and dramatic descriptions of the hero in full, grimdark glory. We'll look at each of the major ancient sources and consider how they have been received through the Middle Ages, early modern period, and up to the present day. But 
let's first summarize Tidus's life story. Now, as I'm sure you'll all be aware, there is never a single definitive authorized, if you like, account of any mythological character's tale. With each telling and retelling, a poet, writer or artist will add his or her own details, choose their favourite versions or make them up. But what follows is, for the most part, a broadly common account. Tidus was, by all accounts, on the short side, but fearsomely strong, capable of overweening violence, even of bloodthirsty madness. In the Iliad, Athene herself describes Tidus as small in stature, but a fighter. Likewise, Statius notes that although he seemed to be a small man, he was heavily built and his limbs were knotted with muscles. Never before has nature dared to endow so small a body with this spirit and such great strength. Tidus was born in Caledon, which is nowhere near Scotland, the son of King Oinus. At some point, Tidus left home. Why? Speaking about his father, Diomedes skips over the reasons for Tidus' departure from Caledon, merely stating, he went off wandering. Zeus and the other gods willed it, I guess. Diomedes would say that. Rather, it seems that the standard account was that Tidius's departure from his hometown was prompted by his slaughter of his uncles or cousins, a not too unusual trope, and one entirely consistent with Tidius's less than pacifistic nature. Those events are mentioned by scholiasts or ancient commentators on literature. Here's what one such scholiast has to say. Tidius was the son of Oinus and Periboia, daughter of Hippotes. He killed his nephews or cousins, Leocopes and Alcatos, who were scheming against Oinus and, against his will, his paternal uncle Melas, because he was having dinner with them. He fled from the site of the murder and came to Argos, where he was purified by Drastos and married his daughter. So, now that he is part of the royal family of Argos, That's how Tidius gets involved in the expedition against Thebes, as one of the seven against Thebes. It's in this setting that most of the more memorable and best preserved accounts of Tidius come. But let's take a step back and talk about the seven against Thebes. Thebes, a city in Boeotia, or Boeotia, if you're going to pronounce it that way, is the location for a vast number of mostly interconnected myths and stories. It's the city of Oedipus. Yeah, the one who killed his father, married his mother, and gave his name to Freud's complex. A significant portion of the great Athenian tragedies were set here, perhaps because it was a place close to, but just distant enough from Athens, to allow the setting and exploration of mankind's darker and more problematic sides. The cycle of myths and stories around the Theban royal family centering on the Siege of the Seven, was perhaps as significant a source of early Greek epic as the Trojan War itself. There was indeed an early epic about the Siege of Seven, which almost certainly featured Tidius, though it has been lost. The title, Seven Against Thebes, comes from the name of Aeschylus' tragedy, Hepta Epiterbas. More likely, the epic was called the Tabayad or something like that. But Seven Against Thebes is so damn catchy as a name that it kind of, well, caught on. The basic elements of the myth are thus. Oedipus, after the revelations about his complex personal life, for some reason or other curses his two sons, Eteocles or Etiocles, and Polynices or Polynices. The two brothers inherit the throne because Oedipus can hardly continue to be the king after all that and agree to take turns, one ruling one year, the other the next, and so on. Obviously enough, it doesn't quite work out like that. And when it's Polynices' turn to take over, Eteocles refuses to give up the throne as if no one saw that coming. Polynices goes off to Argos, to the court of King Adrastus, and assembles an army to take Thebes by force. The army is led by seven princes. Polynices, our friend Tidus, the prophet Amphiaraos, reluctantly, because being a prophet, he knows it's not going to end well for him, but his wife persuades him. 
um, also Cap and Use, and three others whose names vary depending upon the version. Even though they all used Adrastus's palace as their base, and he provides the largest number of combatants, somehow Adrastus doesn't count as one of the seven, but there you go. The seven, and Adrastus, go to war. They lose. All of the seven die, and some of their deaths are especially memorable. A chasm opens up and sucks Amphiarios and his chariot down into hell, and Capenus scales the walls of Thebes on a ladder, now, Zeus happens to be triggered by people climbing on ladders. I don't know, it reminds me of the giants or titans or something. So anyway, he strikes Capenus down with a thunderbolt. Tidius meets his own end, more on that later. And in the final showdown, the two brothers, Eteocles and Polynices, duel to the death. Needless to say, it does not end happily ever after that. In the immediate aftermath, the bodies of the besiegers are left to be picked over by beasts and birds, and that provides the setting for Sophocles' tragedy Antigone. Antigone is the sister of Eteocles and Polynices, and she dies trying to ensure that they both receive a proper burial. Then Theseus, you know, the guy with the Minotaur, intervenes, and yep, there's a sequel a decade or so later, the Sons of the Seven, including Diomedes, return, and this time they conquer Thebes, but that's for another time. So back to Tidius. He's one of the seven, and he features in three or four episodes from the war. The first episodes are really preludes to the war itself. Tidius is sent off ahead of the army as a lone ambassador to Thebes, and all kinds of stuff kicks off. This part of the tale is also preserved in the Iliad. In Book 4, Agamemnon tells Diomedes about his father's exploits in an effort to shame him into battle. Then the Achaeans set forth Tidius as ambassador. But he came upon many Thebans attending a banquet in the halls of great Aegeocles. Though he was a stranger, all alone amongst the many Thebans, Tidius the horseman was not worried. He challenged them to a contest and easily beat them all, for such was the assistance of Athene. The Thebans, drivers of horses, were enraged and they led a fierce ambush of fifty young men against him when he was leaving. There were two leaders, Mayan son of Hymen, a peer of the immortals, and Polypontes son of Altophanos, staunch in war. But Tidius delivered a terrible fate to them all, sending just one of them, Mayan, home, obeying the portents of the gods. Such a man was Tidius, the Aetolian. It is most likely at some point when the armies of the Seven plus Adrastus are camped outside Thebes, if not during Tidius's one-man mission to Thebes itself, that the next episode takes place. Now, this is best described as non-canonical. Our only literary source is a fragment, uh, a summary rather, of a poem by the poet Mimnermnos, in which apparently Tidius kills a certain Ismene, acting on Athene's orders because she's shagging someone called Periclimus or whatever. I don't know what all that's about. Presumably this Ismene is the same Ismene who is Antigone's sister, but in this regard the account is inconsistent with the canonical versions of the Theban stories, because a very much still alive Ismene features as one of the key secondary characters in Sophocles' tragedy Antigone. Now this obscure tale is, however, worthy of mention for the sole reason that it is the scene of one of the very few ancient pictorial representations of Tidius, a pot decorated by the painter now known as the Tidius Painter. So I really had to mention it, but, you know, here's a picture and whatever. Back to the canon. The Seven and Adrastus begin their siege and do battle beside the walls of Thebes. This is the setting of Aeschylus' tragedy, Seven Against Thebes, which contains our most extended and vivid description of Tidius in ancient Greek literature. The Seven Against Thebes is a strange play, or at least it may seem so to us, a modern audience. To me, it's a fascinating fossil. It preserves a point in time in tragedy's transformation from uh, its ritualistic roots to a more recognisable dramatic format, the kind familiar from the likes of Sophocles and Euripides, which, from a cursory view, seem almost like modern dramas to us. 
The core of the play comprises a series of speeches exchanged between a scout come messenger and the king of the besieged Thebans, Etiocles. The messenger describes each of the besieging seven heroes in turn, and Etiocles responds by describing and appointing a hero to fight said besieger, and sure enough appoints himself to fight his brother Polynices, setting up the fratricidal duel which takes place off stage. Like I say, the back and forth has a distinctly ritualistic feel, much unlike what modern audiences expect from a play. Incidentally, if you want to dig deeper into the Seven, then I highly recommend checking out the abridged lockdown version put on by the Centre of Hellenic Studies and Out of Chaos Theatre. There's a link in the description. It's, it's, it's quite cool how well it works. Check out, for example, Sarah Valentine as the messenger. It's kind of funny, but surprisingly effective. Um, it's around 28 minutes 25 for the tedious section. So here's the messenger's speech. Tidius stands roaring at the Protician gate because the prophet did not allow him to ford the river Ismenus on the grounds that the sacrifice was inauspicious. So Tidius rages, impatient for battle. He screams noontime cries like a snake and berates the wise prophet Euclides, calling him an idiot and a coward. He shakes the threefold plume on his helmet and his shield, which rings with bronze bells a horror soundtrack. On his shield, he brandishes an arrogant sign, a burning sky beneath the stars. In its midst, a bright full moon, the oldest of stars, the eye of the night, burning bright and clear. Thus roused to war, he screams his arrogant rages across to the other riverbank, lusting for battle, his horse struggling at the bit, waiting and desperate for the battle clarion's cry. In response to every speech of the messenger, Etocles gives a ritualistic answer. He trash talks the challenger in question, which is fine, he's off stage and safely out of earshot, and proclaims the champion that he will set against him. Against Tidius, Etocles proclaims, I shall set the trusty son of Astarchus, the gateway's guardian. That man is well born and honours the throne of Aeschines, a man who despises arrogant words. He has integrity, he shines bright, and is not the kind to do ill. He is descended from the sown men, those whom Ares spared, a true son of the city, Melanippos. So the fighting proper begins. Tidius fights in all his might and fury, watched over and assisted by his ever-present guardian Athene. Eventually, he meets his match when he encounters Melanippos, the champion appointed by Etocles to fight against him. The details vary with each telling, but by all accounts Tidius is mortally wounded by Melanippos, but he ultimately defeats him. At this point, as Tidius lies dying, Athene returns to Olympus and beseeches Zeus, her father, to allow her to aid Tidius. Zeus relents and Athene returns to the battlefield with an elixir or charm, in some accounts to heal Tidius, in others to deify him so that he may join Athene and the Olympian gods. Either way, she comes bearing the ultimate power-up for her dying protégé. But meanwhile, quite what happens and why varies. By some accounts, Tidius' powers are egging him on. Why, who knows, sadism, jolly japes. According to Statius, on the other hand, it's the Fury Tisiphone, who's on a mission to cause as much horror and misery as divinely possible, and she urges him on. But when Athene arrives on the scene, <laughs> there is Tidius gorging himself on the brains of Melanippos, dining from his decapitated head, or from what it seems from certain pictorial representations, munching away at the still-attached head of the apparently very much alive Melanippos. Athene is totally grossed out by this, and is like, seriously? That's it, she's totally turned off, and goes off in disgust, taking the elixir with her and leaving the crazed cannibal Tidius to die. Though that's not enough to turn her affections from Tidius entirely and permanently. In the Iliad, Athene acts as a guardian to Tidius's son Diomedes, 
and encourages him with tales of his father, tactfully omitting that little incident. But though Athene may choose to forget, posterity certainly hasn't. Whenever Tidius is remembered at all, it's usually for his brain-eating cannibalistic frolics. One final piece of the tradition. It seems that, by some accounts, Tidius was an Argonaut, one of Jason's crew. Now, the only ancient source that I'm aware of for this are a couple of brief and fleeting mentions of Tidius in the Argonautica by Valerius Flaccus, a silver Latin poet. Now, I don't know of any Greek references, do you? If so, tell us about it in the comments. And meantime, here's a picture of Tidius with his brother Meliaga on the Argo. So that concludes our survey of Tidius's depictions in the ancient Greek literary record. We've already touched upon his depiction by Latin poets, and in the next episode of Tidius, Grim Dark Epic Hero, we'll focus on Tidius's depiction by the master of the Grim Dark genre, Statius. Meantime, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon.